Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you, Dina. Thank you. Um, meeting you has definitely changed my life um, for oh. the better, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, I love what you're doing. I love the platform. I'm a fan of your social media, and I'm, I, I think you're doing really important work around many things, right? I mean, around domestic abuse, divorce, life changes, and even touching on stories of recovery. It's but thank you, Dana. I, uh, I think you do an amazing job from what I've seen, and I've watched a few of your podcasts, and I've done a lot of podcasts and that, and you let people, it just, people just talk. It flows out of them. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dina Court, and this is the Life Changes Channel podcast. We're talking about all kinds of different things involving major life changes, including divorce, separation, as well as tons of other stuff. So please go back and listen to all the episodes. You're going to find a lot of gold, a lot of help, a lot of support. And at the very least, I promise you're going to know that you are not alone. There are people who truly care and want to help you. Now, in Today's episode, we are going to be talking to a specialist in coercive control. And as you know, if you've been here a while, you know that I am very passionate about bringing more awareness to the factors that contribute to domestic abuse, family violence, and what we can do about that, how we can better understand, how we can support people who are in it or coming out of it or are out of it trying to heal, and also to just understand how hard this can be to spot. Now, course of control is often a part of that power over situation where people are manipulative and it, it's this pattern and you talk about, you try and explain it to people and you don't even find the words yourself. In fact, Trish even shares how it wasn't until she left the situation that she understood why it had felt wrong, why something had felt off. Now, also in this community, we have magazines, the Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine. They come out quarterly and they're online, easy to access, easy to share, easy to read, easy to find. And online support groups, there's a blog, there is this podcast, which is actually the top divorce podcast in Canada. And our magazines rank in the top in the world as well for divorce magazines. So people are finding this, the trusted resources, the information that is here for you. There is a blog and oh, back to these events, they're every two weeks, they're online, super easy to attend. And grab your tickets quick because the first 15 tickets are free so you can get in at no cost and it's online so you can jump in on from your phone or from anything uh, anywhere you might be or where you feel safe to do so and I'm really excited to have you here so let's meet Trish now and learn more about coercive control. Okay, Trish, guys, is with us. She is just a, a ray of light in this whole dark subject of violence, abuse, narcissistic, uh, coercive control that we are hearing, finally starting to hear more about. And we're finally seeing changes being made. And I think having voices like Trish who is very driven, I want to say. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I think driven because you've gone so far as to educate yourself around this. So I'm so pleased to have people in our world who are doing the work that you're doing. Welcome, Trish. Please tell us more about you, your why, and the work that you do. Sure. Well, thank you, Dina. It's great to be here. And I have to say, I've never been called a ray of light before, but I take that as a huge compliment, <laughs> especially as you said in this field, because I oftentimes will think back to some of the sessions I have with clients. And sometimes I have messages for them that aren't so um, ray of light esque. And, but somehow I'm able to get them to see that there is that beacon of hope out there. And it's just about gaining some autonomy. But to answer your question, uh, or uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I, like many others of your listeners, have been through um, an abusive relationship, but I didn't know it at the time. And it turns out after the fact, I learned that it was a very coercively controlling relationship because uh, when I was in it, 
I knew something was wrong and it didn't feel right, but I didn't have a label for it. And I just thought that it was just a difficult relationship where we just didn't connect well. But since leaving and since um, like post-separation, everything seemed to ramp up. Uh, I went through about 12 years of trying to navigate that. And what I found frustrating was that nobody seemed to understand. I had to explain, I had to justify. And even still, whether it was lawyers, psychologists, judges, it didn't matter. It was very, very difficult to get them to understand because sometimes I couldn't even find the words. So I spent the majority of my time when I wasn't dealing with the legal aspects and just researching everything that I could to educate. And then I came across um, the master's program of psychology of, of uh, coercive control. And so I ended up involving myself in that, um, obtained my master's and learned a lot through that and through a research study that I did for my dissertation and decided to be that person whom I would have loved to have had during my journey. Someone that can not only support me, but I think more importantly, warn me as to what to expect and to not fall for some of the tactics and not to be duped by certain things. And so that's what I do for clients now is I do a whole host of things. When I first started, that's what I did. I just supported them through the divorce process. Then I've added um, mediation support. So uh, preparing people for mediation, then co-parenting. And now I've moved into as well um, litigation support. So um, helping you collect your evidence, writing your affidavits, uh, your response affidavits, doing parenting plan evaluations, which in Alberta are called PN7s, Voice of a Child or PN8s. And so now I'm, I've got a whole suite of services, right from starting a divorce right through to litigation or mediation, if that's what you're doing. Wow. <laughs> I just <laughs> have to say, wow. For so many reasons, because not only do you bring personal experience, a trauma informed approach, because you've not only experienced it personally, zero judgment, because you were there and you didn't know what it was, you hadn't labeled it, you knew something felt off. Many, many people are judged, criticized and not accepted or believed because they themselves didn't realize or believe. Then when they do have that reckoning and that aha and that, oh my God, now that I'm out looking back or I'm learning about it, I'm still in it and I'm starting to recognize what I'm in, they then are ready to look for some help, look for some support. Let's get out. They now are, I guess, ready is still the word. They're ready to reach for that help and accept it. Now try and convince other people in your world when you yourself sitting in the middle of it didn't realize what you were in. So mm -hmm. now you talk to a trusted friend or a family member. And even if they go to, like you mentioned, some of the legal professionals or the therapists that don't understand, recognize, and they now make you question the validity of what you are, you know, in your bones, you know, that instinctually now you've been able to identify what it is and how unsafe it is or was, and you're trying to get away or heal. So to be able to work with someone who's already taken that journey has incredible amounts of knowledge from education, science, research. There's so much backing up what they are feeling and validating them. And then to have somebody who can walk you through not only just your own personal healing, but the practical, tangible things that you are going to have to deal with, with that person, as you find safety, or you need to continue parenting with them, and you heal, you start creating your own new life. So this is just such a beautiful gift that you are bringing. And I want to thank you from the general public for doing this, because I can't imagine how difficult some of these stages were for you, especially when you are, I'm guessing, healing through it yourself at the same time. You are learning, you're having new layers uncovered and going, oh, God, like that's another thing that I didn't realize I'd been affected by. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned all that because the journey itself, my professional journey has been fascinating for me because oftentimes people will say, it must be difficult for you to hear these stories. And absolutely, I, 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 I'd be a sociopath, I think, if I enjoyed hearing the stories. I, I really don't. But what counteracts that is the, and I only can think of it as joy, and this may sound strange, but the joy I feel in having some bit of knowledge and also the passion to help people, even if it's just one element, even if it's just the practical, because oftentimes, you know, I, I make sure I don't uh, blur the lines with therapy. Yes, we'll talk about emotions and the trauma, but I really like to focus on the practical and just to tell it like it is. And that's what a lot of the, a lot of my clients appreciate is just give it to me straight. And so there's that trust factor because they know I've been there. And that to me is the most empowering. It makes the experience I had um, worthwhile, I guess, because I didn't have a choice. I had to go through it. I can't undo it. But there's something to be said about using what I've learned and being able to help others. And, you know, it's interesting. I've had so many clients or other people, just random strangers who have contacted me to say, look, I have all this information. Can this, do you think you can use some of this for your courses or your research to help other people? I've had people even say to me, you know, use my material, obviously take my name out, but I really I know I can't do anything about my situation, but to help others. And every single time I get goosebumps, because that to me is a green flag for, if you don't know if a person is a victim, that is a good sign. You know, you you would think that after all they've been through, the last thing they'd want to do is to revisit things. They, they don't mind doing it as long as it helps somebody else. And that's how I feel is I have just a, a whole treasure trove of information and that I keep learning and keep experiencing through other clients that I have to share it um, because it's it's like sitting on a gold mine and not being able to share it would be, I think, very uh, counter counter to healing. And I've done my healing, but it's, uh, it's the whole point of doing what I do, too, is so much of what they need, people need to do is, is counterintuitive. You get a lot of what you think may be good advice from family and friends, very well-meaning, but when you're dealing with the people that you deal with, when they're coercively controlling uh, victims, uh, a lot of it is not uh, common sense. And so the advice or the expectations placed on victims are counter to what really should be occurring. I often have said you can't rationalize irrational behavior. And I had, I ran that through my head for years, even before I left or used it when I'd be talking to friends about, you know, or family that were trying to figure out how could somebody act or be that way. Right. And you can't rationalize it because it's irrational. There's no way you, you, if I could get back the years of my life that I spent, even after I left trying to understand, okay, what did I do to make this person treat me this way? How was I to blame? How trying? What did I say? How did I trigger? And, you know, it, it can't be understood. And like you say, the advice that's given comes from that place of you're assuming that they see the world the same way that you see the world, but right. it doesn't work that way. So those solutions don't work. And I actually came across an interesting piece and I I wish I could credit who where I read it or heard it because this was years ago and I was still in an abusive situation but a friend of mine was really she was out but kind of but not and and I used I heard this reverse psychology thing and it totally worked very quickly where she would tell me about something that he'd done how he treated her whatever and I'd always agree with her like oh my god what a jerk you know and then I heard, no, she automatically is going to feel the need to defend him. So I would start defending him, go, I don't know, maybe he didn't really mean it that way. Or I don't know, you might have been being oversensitive. I, he's actually probably a pretty good guy on the inside. And then she would just be like, no, he's not. And here's another incident and da, da, da. And then that shifted. And I didn't think it was going to work that easily. But within a couple of weeks, she said, what's changed here that what's different? Like I, and she was able to actually leave and cut that tie. So sometimes that might work for some people, but I like what you say, where they get some advice that maybe it doesn't work so well. So mm -hmm. um, to be able to talk to someone who has not only been there, 
but has learned some methods to help them. And I couldn't help but think when you were describing, when people are sharing these stories and yes, they can be hard to hear, but from your perspective, you're already seeing, oh, there's a window. There's something they mm. can do. There's, a, oh, I, I'm seeing solutions. I'm seeing things they could try. Right. And as they share, then I think that helps mitigate some of that dark, heavy hopelessness right. that you would be experiencing by, you know, reliving abuse through other people's stories. Exactly. I think as you're mentioning that, I, I actually, an image popped into my head one of those fun houses full of mirrors and so I envision when clients just as it happened with me you think of ideas or you think of something that's happened you talk to your lawyer and you assume that this is logical we should be able to stop this behavior because it's abusive and then you hear you're right it is abusive but there's nothing we can do so it's like walking through one of those mazes and every time you turn around and you think you see the way out you end up hitting the wall or hitting the mirror and whereas with me I do not have all the answers. And sometimes my answer is simply, you can't change their behavior. In fact, that's always my answer because the question always seems to be, how do I get this to stop? And back to your original point about uh, trying to be rational about irrational behavior, that is really the key. If, if, if people learn nothing else, I think it should be that because you waste so much time, effort, and, and you create so much heartache trying to understand and then trying to strategize based on that understanding, right? So your strategy is how would, would be effective with a rational person who's not abusive, who's not using tactics to manipulate and control you. That probably would work. But most times, like when a person's finally decided and they've left, so past what you were talking about, um, you it, it's really not advisable usually to be giving up a lot because your thought process is as it is in the legal industry, you know, we need to mediate, we need to come to the table, we need to um, uh, cooperate, negotiate. What ends up happening is victims need to and are expected to capitulate. So when we talk about mediation, I think mediation is great, but oftentimes in these domestic uh, abuse situations, uh, we can be fooled and thinking, ah, it worked, it was effective. Sure. We can have an agreement at the end of the day, but I can promise you it most likely is not because two equal parties came to the table and there was some good give and take. Absolutely not, because we go into it with a severe power differential and a power imbalance, and you can't create a binding um, effective contract, which essentially you're trying to achieve through mediation when two parties are at odds, but in terms of power, not in terms of uh, beliefs or what they want. And so what ends up happening usually is the victim will oftentimes capitulate. They're often um, encouraged to capitulate in the form of being cooperative. You know, you'll, they'll hear things like, you know what, let's just give them what they want. Then they'll go away. We can get this done and over with. And so ultimately we fall for that because that's what we want. We don't want to drag this out. We just essentially want things to stop. And I haven't met a, a person yet who is out to get more than what's deserved. In fact, most people are willing to give up a lot just so they can have peace. But my, uh, in my experience, it's best to, before going into any of that, to be very clear about what you want to do and what you need, irrespective of what you think the response will be, because you will capitulate until there's nothing left to capitulate on. And uh, because the issue is never the issue, the goalposts keep moving and you'll never make that individual happy. So um, to not fall for thinking, okay, if I do X, like you're saying, then maybe they'll do Y. That typically does not happen. Um, there are ways to perhaps quote unquote, not poke the bear. But I feel like when we, when we expect victims to, you know, uh, be the better person, don't poke the bear, let's not make things difficult, all those things. To me, it's almost re-victimizing because they have up to this point, that's all they've had to do. They've had to tiptoe, they've had to suffer in silence. They've had to squash their needs, wants, opinions, everything. They've had autonomy ripped from them. And when we expect them then to again, essentially bow to the abuser's demands, um, to me that is re-victimizing. And often client, uh, victims will say that, especially when it's done by an advocate or who's supposed to be an advocate, like a lawyer, let's say, or someone of that nature, that secondary victimization and that betrayal is 
oftentimes feels more damaging than the original abuse. And so that's why in this profession, I feel we need to be so well versed in trauma. And you mentioned trauma informed at the beginning, and that's so key. Uh, you don't have to know anything about domestic abuse as long as you understand at first to understand how to be trauma informed and how to understand or to understand how you articulate things to a victim. Because, you know, you don't want to give them false promises, but you, you really should not be um, giving them false hopelessness either. You know, you want to be able to work with them and be honest, but to not weigh, so many times they feel the, the pressure of, if you don't agree, we're never going to finish this. Essentially saying, if we don't come to an agreement, it's your fault. And that's such a damaging thought process that most people, most professions, I don't think put two and two together and realize because that's not what they're trying to say, but that's in effect what they're hearing. That comes from a lot of the conditioning, wouldn't you say, Trish, from from mm -hmm. those, you know, whether it's weeks, months, years of of that type of course of control, you're conditioned to hear it that way. You're going to perceive it that way. Because again, like I mentioned about the rational or irrational, you've already put a lot of energy into figuring out what you did wrong to cause it. How could you uh, not trigger or poke the bear, right? Mm -hmm. So you're already set up to perceive things that way. So it's um, maybe it would be helpful. I'm just kind of <laughs> throwing you under the bus here, but is there some <laughs> verbiage that people could consider from as a supportive community, whether, whether you're a friend, a coworker, a family member, what are some things they can say? How can they be supportive to open those conversations and make that person feel um, safe to, to share and to feel not judged? Yeah, that's, and I know that's really difficult with, uh, for a lot of people. And, and I, I, I have to be fully transparent too. I do this for a living, but when I have to do it or when I'm uh, called on to do it personally, it takes on a whole new dimension. Yes. And so it's a lot more difficult, right? But, uh, um, you know, I think first and foremost, we want to make sure that they don't feel judged because it takes such gumption, it takes such courage to speak about it with anybody because you are running the risk of not being believed or even worse, having them say, but don't you have some hand in it? Or don't, I mean, because obviously victims always know, as you just mentioned, they've had some hand in it, even if they didn't. We're the first ones to take responsibility and accountability. We don't need anyone else to point that out for us. You know, that's uh, that that's a given. So, and you're right. We don't need somebody who's supporting us to also um, vilify the abuser. We also know that 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 individual has been causing that, us pain. But I think what's important is to make sure that victims understand that they did nothing, even though they may feel they're, they're some, somehow complicit in this, no one can do anything to make a person behave in a way that they're trying to manipulate them, control them, denigrate them. Because it's not just about being mean or being abusive. It's about trying to uh, make that person completely subordinate to that abuser. Nobody has the right to do that. We don't even have the right to do that to our children. Um, and, and to get them to see that this is not their fault. And what, what is interesting, too, is that based on some research that's been done on something called the homicide timeline that we can talk about another day, the research shows that people who engage in this behavior, you know, let's say so you're in a relationship with this individual, it really doesn't have a lot to do with you because they've come to you that way. They've done this to other people. And, you know, one thing that you can look at, too, is that Sometimes I find victims will be um, are very good at perhaps understanding that person's behavior too much or giving rationales and saying, well, they've had a difficult childhood or all these things. He means well, she means well, they're a good parent, all these things. But um, what in actual fact happens is the fact that if you look at it, I don't know of an abuser who actually abuses every single person in their sphere. So they're not doing it to their boss. Not doing it to the cashier necessarily. They're not doing it to anyone who has potential authority or power over them. They only do it to people who don't have as much power. So victim, children, pets, those kinds of things. And so that's really important for them to see because I think we, when we're supporting an individual, 
we want to do all the things like validation and let them know that there's absolutely no judgment um, and that checking with them too to see, do you want me to help you work through some solutions or do you want me just to listen? But beyond that, also to help them start thinking about practical demonstrative steps. And you don't have to come up with the solutions, but just to help bring that out in them because it's a process whereby you start to get upset, but then you get kind of clouded within that and you don't know what the next step will be. It's very common to get decision paralysis. And so what I find helpful is a bit of Socratic questioning. And so that's a psychological term, but essentially what you're trying to do is input logic into an emotional, irrational thinking process. So we tend to catastrophize and oftentimes that's legitimate in, in, a, in a victim situation because their brains have learned to protect us, right? Uh, sometimes it just takes a look, it takes a word, it takes whatever, and your brain automatically goes into protection mode. But that's gonna to happen too in terms of, oh, we're thinking that the, um, the mediation is just going to blow up in our face or all these things. What you wanna do and what, how you can help victims is to get them to write down what their fear is. So whatever their fear is, and then to look at the pros and cons or rather look at the arguments for that being a correct thought and against. Look at tangible, practical elements out in the world that will say, yes, this could happen and here's why, and here's the evidence. So what you're looking for is evidence or this is evidence to the contrary. Because what that does then is you're trying to switch the, switch the brain from that emotional part to the logical part, because you're getting them to kind of think outside themselves and actually looking in the environment for evidence. And it takes a lot of practice, but questioning them, getting them to kind of question their beliefs in a tricky way helps. And then, then you can move on to things like, okay, how can we look at this differently? But that starts the process of looking at practical steps. So you're questioning so you stop that thinking before it gets into the rumination stage so that you can start thinking logically, okay, now what are the chances of this happening? And if so, what can I do about it? There's a lot of plan B planning that goes along with it too. Trish, can you give us some examples? Like my mind is pulling up examples of some things mm -hmm. that could challenge, like where would I ever go? I have nowhere to go, nowhere to live. I can't support myself. What about the kids? What about the pets? Like, are those some of the things that you could say, okay, those are your fears. Now let's, let's just sit down and even together, because I think a lot of the people resist that those cringy conversations and kind of, oh, you know, walk away, change that because they are uh, terrified. They don't know how to help this person. It's like, don't tell me that because I don't know how to fix it for you. I don't know how to help you. So this way, it would give them an opportunity to help together, help them. Okay, well, what are you afraid of? Can I help you look for um, that evidence to support it or to say, oh, no, like there is, can you give us maybe some examples sure. or is that what you're talking about? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, no, it's a great idea. So uh, for instance, in terms of deciding whether to leave, not whether to leave or can I leave? And it takes on average about seven times for an individual to leave an abusive relationship. And so that also too, back to the supporting, um, if an individual talks about leaving and then relents and stays, that to mention to them that, you know, you understand how difficult this must be and that it's okay. And that it's not a failure and you don't have to excuse why. And you can even mention that I hear that it takes women oftentimes an average of seven times to leave because it's so complicated. And you mentioned some of the things that where am I going to live? Where am I going to stay? How can I afford it? Um, he's going, he, it's usually he, but he or she's going to take everything of mine. How do I do it? And so one of the suggestions I would I take to, to completely get it off your plate is to suggest a uh, victim contacting uh, an organization such as Suggest. They're a d domestic violence educational um, um, and advocacy program. They're fantastic. I'm volunteering with them and they're, they're great. And they have different programs that are geared towards helping individuals escape or leave a situation, but also to uh, shore up your autonomy again and shore up your confidence and things that have been stripped from you. Because a lot of that, I wouldn't suggest we as support systems even try because that's out of our realm and that's something that they have perfected. And it's often good to have a third party do that. But in terms of, you know, you start to ruminate and think, 
I'll never escape. I'll never be free of them and whatnot. And, and really, so you want to look at, okay, let's look at first steps. And one of the first steps I suggest to people is you want to make sure you have your finances in order because you will need to do that. Even if it's a somewhat amicable split, you'll need to split up finances and you need to have access to all that. Oftentimes, um, uh, the, the women, some of the women I work with, uh, I haven't had any men have this happen yet, but they don't have a sole bank account. They don't have a credit card in the name. Like there's some things you can do. There's quite a few things you can do to set yourself up for success before you leave. Because if you just um, leave, and some people do, but there's that fear of I'll have nothing. And that could potentially happen at first. It's hard to claw back. So my suggestion is, is to start that falling back of the power and the autonomy and the independence and doing something safely, but uh, obtaining your own bank account. You don't need to tell your partner that. You don't need to tell anybody that's your business. Um, you know, as long as it's safe, as well as if you can get yourself a credit card or put something in your name to make sure you're establishing credit. Um, and then you want to make sure that you have access to all the financials because what I see oftentimes is that the dissolution happens, the separation happens, and they, they don't have access to a lot of the accounts because the other uh, party has now locked them out of the account. So you want to make sure you want to be strategic about this. Unless you are like, is da danger is imminent, then yes, you must leave. And I would suggest you contact a shelter or contact Sages. But if that's not the case, be strategic about it. Plan it like you plan a holiday. Plan it like you plan the next new purchase or your home. Like be smart about it and get access to as much as you can. The last three years of your taxes, get as much information as you can. Also, um, including house title, um, those kinds of things. And start researching your support system, whether it's a realtor, whether it's an appraiser, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a therapist, all those different things. You want to have all of that in your back pocket ideally before you even have that conversation because to me that helps with the, the the switching the brain over to the logic because you're you're helping them uh take steps concrete tangible steps and then at least you have something backing you because the lack of information the ambiguity is the scariest part and so of course you start to uh panic but if you have these avenues and you start demonstrably trying to prepare for the inevitable, and that's great. And how I do it too is, is that, you know, like if you're going to be, you're going to be splitting up the finances and so through mediation usually, so you'll need access to all that and you'll save yourself so much time and money and not having to go back and forth between lawyers if you have access to all of the financials. So those are some of the practical, I hope that answered your question, but those are some of the practical things I would say, you know, as a support person, okay, well, let's look at the finances, even sit down with them and say, let's just hash this out. What kind of debt do you have? What kind of assets do you have? What would you like to see ideally? Those kinds of things as if you would, if um, a divorce wasn't happening. You know, if there's a friend of yours or family member that, you know, and they're struggling financially, let's look at that. Um, and, and I think that also helps because we tend to catastrophize things in our mind. The financials might not be as um, daunting as one may think because finances is a big deal. I found most victims uh, finances is a trigger. So we need to start working on that from the get-go and avoiding things is an anxiety, is an anxiety's best friend. The more you avoid, the bigger the anxiety. Yes, that is, that's powerful information. Just that the picture can be drawn for people that there is hope. There are options. You aren't stuck. And here's like, here is actual, like you said, tangible and actionable and hopeful that there's a light oh okay so maybe you know test that is it true let's look for evidence am i really stuck is there no hope like you mentioned the finances are they as bad as i fear or are there ways i can start to build some autonomy and get a sense of being um, outside of this and in a safe place now we can't talk about this without um I know some of the very important things that I have shared on other episodes and, and other podcasts and things like that is having a checklist for what you need in an emergency. And some people will say, well, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like it'll ever get to that point. The shift in your uh, whole 
approach to life, to everything. There's a shift that happens when you are starting to think about leaving. And that person who's using course of control over you is super sensitive to that. And mm-hmm. they, they sense that. And from that moment until, and, and when, and even after you've left is the most dangerous time. So when they sense that, even if you haven't felt like you would ever need an emergency plan and emergency some things that are out of the home, some uh, copies of important documents, your finances, your taxes, your insurance policy, your title to your home, uh, medication, extra medications, extra, you know, things for the kids, whatever that might be. If you have that plan, then if an emergency presents itself, you're out a lot quicker and feel more confident than you're going, Oh my God, I'm, I'm not, I, I need to get out, but I don't, but I, what do I need to take with me? And you are not in a place to be making uh, that decision. And in some cases, it could be a fatal pause. So I think a checklist of uh, like a safety plan, an emergency plan, uh, telling someone, talking to someone you trust. And the third thing is to start documenting if you have, if you aren't already, because maybe you can address this, but my understanding is there's a couple of reasons for that. First, you start to realize the frequency and intensity, because we have so downplayed it, we've taken the blame, we've tried to figure out, um, you know, what caused it. And, and, and then we push it aside, because we think, well, I, I've now figured out that I, I, I triggered that or whatever it might be, we don't realize how often how severe it is. But that can also be used to at least set a precedent in legal matters as well mm-hmm. of a pattern of this person's behavior. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's something that it's just so much easier as we know to document as it's happening or as it's just happened versus two years later and to be as detailed as possible. And to, it'll be interesting, as you say, as you document, you'll start to see the patterns because to sit and think about, okay, what's the pattern that can be difficult, but you'll start to see, oh, and you'll start to link these things together. And just like anything, when you go back and look at them, It'll make more sense because even at the time, if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. Document it. Just write it, write it as it happened. Don't have to make sense of it. Don't have to label it. Nothing like that. Just put it down when it doesn't feel right, you know, and put that down because I, I, I can almost guarantee when you look back, you'll say, oh, geez, because it's very difficult, no matter how great your memory is to remember things as they were. And keep in mind, if you have been in an abusive situation, typically you end up having changes happen to your brain. Trauma does that. And it's very difficult for us to remember things chronologically, to remember things in its uh, events that happen in their entirety. And sometimes we mix up um, what was said or who said it first or whatever. That is so normal, but most people don't know that. We don't know that as victims oftentimes, but professionals sometimes either don't know that or forget that. So it comes across as we're being, uh, we're not being as credible as they'd like to see and it attacks our credibility. So that also helps. Um, that's something that we shouldn't be questioned on our credibility, but we're still working through that myth with a lot of people. So documenting uh, will be very advantageous. And, and I think too, back to your checklist example, it's so important to do that. Yes, when you're rational, when you're calm, when you're not having to field um, accusations or, or having to protect yourself. You know, if I have a, let's say, you know, to liken it to, if I'm hiking in the Kananaskis and all of a sudden I see a bear, I'm not able to think about my to-do list. Right? You just can't. All you think of is I have to get the hell out of here. Yeah. And that's what you're thinking when you're in an abusive situation. So, but if you do that calm, you'll think of things that you normally wouldn't think of your passports or this or that, um, your phone numbers, whom you'd have to contact, your your safety contact, whom you could, whose place you could stay at if you leave at a moment's notice, things like that, your pets. There are arrangements you can make to the SBCA to how to take your pets, pack extra, whatever the, the food is for the dog or the cat, whatever. But also, if you end up leaving at a moment's notice and you can't take everything, you there are provisions you can always go back, you know, depending on what the situation is. Sometimes you can go back with the police or with other individuals. Um, that depends on your situation. However, you'll already have the checklist because if you've had to flee that situation and then write a checklist, I don't know how successful you'll be. Um, and the only thing I suggest about that too is 
even before you do that, document, take pictures or video of everything in your home so that you know later what you want to take or what has been taken without your consent, those kinds of things. Yes, that's powerful. Something that popped into my mind that I recently heard that I think is so powerful to help people understand course of control, whether you're the person that's being controlled or a support person that uh, cares about them, is that it is not an incident, it's a pattern. So you might have the final straw and you're just like telling somebody and then he did this and this and that they hear that one incident. It's like, yeah, that, you know, that sounds mean or it's, that seems off, but you're like, but don't, but don't you see how bad that is? Because Mm -hmm. it's an incident that, and they, it just continually erodes you. And it's this pattern and this continual, it's, it just inundates you. And I'm so appreciative that you mentioned memory and how it it affects our brains. And literally people think they're losing their minds often mm-hmm. when they're in that situation. And then they're and then that is used as a control against them. Yes. yes. And it's usually someone like a spouse that you're it can be a parent that you're very close to, that you have shared things that you have concerns and vulnerabilities, mm-hmm. and those become weapons. Yes. Exactly. Well, you know, I can give you an example back to the memory. I always use this personal example. Years ago, when I live in Calgary, years ago, Prince, when he was alive, came and had a concert. Always wanted to see him. Growing up, I loved Prince. And uh, apparently we went to the concert, but I don't remember going nor having been there. I remember nothing about it. It's like it never happened. And I didn't know that until years ago, years after it occurred, my husband and I were talking and I thought, oh, you know, I said, it's really a shame. There's a few artists I would have loved to have seen before they passed. And I mentioned Prince and he said, what are you talking about? We saw Prince. And said, really? No idea. No idea. Because well, partially we didn't have any pictures or, or any evidence because photos and videos were not allowed at the concert. Yeah. But I had literally no recollection. And then I started thinking, so I started asking him about some other things and there were quite a few other things. And when I look back at those, that time frame, that was in a time frame where the, I had, it was soon after I left to maybe a year or two, but it was very intense, the abuse. And I had no idea at the time that my memory would be affected. And it was quite disconcerting when I thought that I thought, my goodness, your brain tries to protect you, but to a to, you think that they would it would try and protect you only from the bad, but sometimes mm-hmm. it can erase the good. And so, so that example I always tell people is that that's a good thing. I want to remember, and I, I I don't know if I'll ever remember those details, but that happens, of course, with the bad. So, so that's where documentation will help, because uh, you're right. Because then people will perhaps judge or think, you know, really, is that, did that really happen? Because you're not remembering certain things. But if you look at scientific evidence regarding expert testimony, uh, or sorry, a witness, uh, witness testimony, witness testimony is very unreliable, because our memories aren't great, even at the best times, but under trauma, no, definitely. So um, now, sorry, I editorialized too much. Now I forgot what you were asking me in the first place. <laughs> me too. <I'm laughs> like... You get me on a tangent and that's what happens. Should have warned you. I just, I think it's important around the incidents and the pattern and that we all acknowledge that, you know, people do feel like they're losing their mind. And I mean, for me, one of the things that uh, for over 30 years, it was an insult to use my maiden name, ran down my family, and there was nothing to run them down about, but found ways. And the small town that I was from. And so I found that as I raised my children, there'd be things like, Oh, I I'd have a memory from childhood. I would want to share. And I learned over time that was only going to open myself up to abuse and criticism. And, you know, not always in front of the children, but I, I literally was struggling as the years progressed to even remember my childhood. Because it had been used against me. It was an unsafe topic. And I just felt like I'd lost. I've just lost huge chunks of my life. And what's funny now is uh, with with my bonus children now, Mm -hmm. if something comes up, even though I'm not their mother biologically, I'll 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 feel so excited to share a childhood memory that's just popped up because to me it's like there's one it's back this is this is relative to what's happening right now and I can share it I'm safe to share it and 
but it's terrifying to, to think of that. And, you know, this is another whole tangent, but I did a very interesting, um, <clears throat> I think it was on a video that, oh, what's it called? Reconciliation, your inner child reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying when I went through mm -hmm. this to find this sweet, innocent, happy child locked in some dark, dim room and so happy to see me. And if everybody's mm -hmm. ever done this, you can kind of relate mm -hmm. to how you, it's like, there's this child and I was ashamed of her. I was forced to have been ashamed of mm -hmm. her and ignored her. And she was, she was semi transparent when I found her and you just feel like, Oh, I've just about completely out of that control that I was under and that fear lost that part of me. Wow. That's extremely powerful. I think that whole, the word erase comes to mind when you talk about that. And not only is your everyday self effectively erased because that's what they try and do, but your childhood, I mean, that's, I don't know how much more impactful something can be. I mean, to, and that's the interesting thing about course of control. I mean, you think about the logic of that, how a person, a person's actions, words can go into your mind and effectively erase good or bad memories of childhood and to make you less whole. It's really impactful. And they don't even have to be present at some point to do that because that's how course of control works. It's a beautiful technique to uh, control and manipulate an individual, even in your absence. And so do you make a good point about childhood? So if that happens to an adult and effectively erases their childhood, let's think about the damage that does to a child going through it. And that's the thing that we don't realize is that yes, children are resilient and whatnot, but I don't think we should be allowing this kind of behavior or this exposure to happen to test that resiliency. And, um, you know, we're assuming that yes, kids are resilient if they bump and scrape their knee and things like that, or, or, or but if adults aren't able to understand and work through that, and that can happen, you can't word against that. Children don't have a hope at all to try and word that off. And so I think that's really important. And the pattern, you know, and that's the whole key about course of control. And I think that's partly why we have trouble still as a society on recognizing it and understanding it. And even in the professional world, because up until recently we have been incident-based. It's an incident-based model. That's why the police uh, have difficulty. And I know there's talk of um, criminalization of course of control in this country and a bill is probably going through. That will be interesting to see because we will have to do an entire overhaul of training of the police forces because they won't know how to investigate, how to charge, how to evidence patterns. Mm -hmm. Because even the patterns themselves sometimes aren't overt. You have to, um, you know, a lot of what you're talking about to everybody else, you, it may just look like, oh, it's just a look, or they're just being nasty, or they're just having a bad day, or they didn't mean it, those kinds of things, not understanding that one offs. Oh, okay. But as a pattern, just like anything, it becomes, uh, you, you start to, it starts to take a life of its own. And so what ends up happening is, so you, the first thing you look at is this behavior or pattern. And if it is, then you look at two, well, does this change that person's behavior? So you mentioned, I learned to stop talking about my childhood. So if you stop doing or saying something you normally do, or you start behaving or saying something that you normally wouldn't, that's another flag that this is course of behavior, because now you, your entire being, your thoughts, your behaviors are manipulated, oftentimes to avoid a consequence of being berated, of having the children harmed, you harmed, those kinds of things. And a third thing would be to look at, does this cause the victim fear? You know, the example you gave, of course you were fearful. That's why you chose not to speak of your childhood. You learn very quickly. We're smart beings. We learn to keep ourselves out of harm. And you know, those three things, it's not, it's about pattern, but those other two elements, you throw all those things together, it becomes very clear as to what the behavior is, but you couple all of that with intentionality and a time investment. Because if you look at a certain behavior, what would the intention be or the purpose be of denigrating your family, of, of trying to erase or belittle your childhood? I can't think of one redeeming reason, not one. And so that's the red flag. But also if you think of the time element, so for instance, I'll give you a quick example. I had a client who 
they were quite affluent and the uh, abuser who was the husband would make his wife account this is before she left account for every single penny on the grocery list and whether it was for her for her husband the kids even if it was something he asked for she had to account for that every single item and then he would go item by item and so if you look at something like that people will say well maybe he's just really you know tight with his money he's trying to be fiscally responsible i think you know you just look at the time invested who in the right mind has that much time First of all, to make the money thinking. that they do, right? And who wants to do that? What would be the what would be the intent? And then she has to justify why she bought three avocados, not one. You know, things like that. That's just not normal. And if you look at the time invested, some of these things, you look at them in totality. So there's that element, you know, they do five other things. That's like a full-time job. And so that's a red flag too, because that is a, that is a form of obsession. And sometimes when a person's that obsessed, that is similar to stalking because when we look at stalking we look at the time invested that they you know seek you out to find out where you are to travel to that location to wait for you those kinds of things that is an element that we look at when we're looking at the, the danger level of that individual or that individual's abusive behavior so there's all sorts of things you want to look at it's with all the information we have now it's getting much easier in my mind to pinpoint what course of control is and now the next step is so what do we do about it mm-hmm. I think the sad thing, Trish, I'm going to go back to when you were talking about children Mm -hmm. and how they're damaged. It's as an adult, it's often somebody that we, we love or did love and we trust. And with Mm -hmm. children, that trust factor is extremely amplified because not only are they completely dependent, let's say completely in most cases Mm -hmm. on their abuser for their physical needs, their emotional needs. They trust them. They look up to them. They try and emulate them. And this is what they're seeing. And they it, they aren't necessarily mature enough to understand those uncomfortable feelings shouldn't be happening to them. And that that, that is a, a red flag, that that is an emotion they should talk to somebody about, that they can share and that they should feel safe to to share. And that often they don't even feel safe, which Mm -hmm. is just, it's just cracks my heart (laughs) in two. Like they don't even feel safe to um, understand and have that space to explore. Why does this feel off? Or, you know, what did I do to make that person upset with me? Or, you know, why am I feeling what, what is this feeling and why am I feeling it? I'm uncomfortable. And it's coming from somebody that I, it's, you know, my mom or my dad, and I should be able to trust them. So it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And it's, you're right. It's tragic, but it's so confusing um, because of that element that this is somebody that, that I'm wholly dependent on. And biologically speaking, we are wired to um, cling to them and to, no matter how they treat us to still admire them, love them because it's, it's necessary. It's a biological need for survival. And that's wired. That's how we're wired. And because some people will say, and I, I was even told this too, that, well, if they're really being that mistreated by their, uh, turns out their father, they'll know it. And when they get old enough, they'll leave. In fact, that has not been my experience. It doesn't matter how old they are. And my example to that is I was an adult and look at how long it took me, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, I was dependent on him, but not as much as children would be. Like, I, I think we, we give too much credence to, well, they've turned 18, so it should be fine. But we really do need to turn to, even if you think that the abusive behavior is not directly pointed towards the children. And some people's attitude is, well, you know, they're good enough. Um, it's just happening to, let's say, the mother or the father, and, you know, they're still a good parent. The science shows that is false. And I believe that as well, too, because... A, I don't know of anyone who behaves and engages in that behavior, stops it when it's the children, because when you separate, now you can't physically control that person. The best way of doing that is to use your children as a mechanism for that. And um, so that happens so frequently. I don't know of a situation where that doesn't happen. Plus, as you mentioned, what does that feel like when you have one parent whom you love doing that, and then you see the other parent being victimized by that. That's really puts a child in a position where they're having to um, grow up way too fast and try to make sense of it. So they're having to protect themselves. Sometimes they take on the protection of the victimized parent. 
And we're also, what we forget too is by our behavior, inadvertently or, or, or meaning to, we're teaching these children how to grow up to be citizens, however yes. they identify. And I think we do a very poor job of that. And you mentioned not wanting, not knowing what to do with those feelings. And that's somewhere that I, I talk to parents a lot about is that above all, that's what we need to do with our children. Just like you do if something happens in the schoolyard or with their friends, you need to do that about this behavior. Doesn't mean you need to vilify the other parent. Doesn't mean you are um, talking ill of them. You're just giving them a safe place to put those feelings, even if it's just to park them or to make sense of them or to talk about them without you, you getting upset without you being judgmental without you saying well that's just how they are those kinds of things you know right. being that safe zone as if they were talking to you about a teacher or something like that because who else are they going to talk to about this and if they don't get to talk about it it becomes normalized and what we find is that with girls they tend to internalize it can look like self-harm depression um those kinds of things you know, yes, the science says sometimes, you know, like uh, um, early pregnancy and things like that. But I find more so with my clients, it's self-harm and, and depression, sleep disturbances. And then the boys tend to, and it's a huge generalization, but they tend to externalize an outward behavior. And so, you know, we have to get rid of that notion that divorce is bad. It's not the divorce. It's not the, it's the conflict. It's the abuse. We need to address that because you're right it's so much easier to handle it when they're children than to try to undo that when we're adults. Thank you, Trish. Oh, we could go on mm -hmm. for hours and hours because it's such a huge topic. A lot of the reason I think is because it's, it's kind of obscure. Like it's hard to nail it down. Right. So the more we talk about it, the more people can hear little things that give them aha moments things, some clarity and a, a new filter to view either their relationship or others uh, that they witness where someone is, you know, wanting to open up a conversation. I know I spoke at an event um, in November and shared some scenarios so that people could kind of see some pictures of incidents mm -hmm. that when you put these all together and one gentleman turned to the organizer and said, oh, I recognize my brother in that. Wow. So hopefully if the brother's wife has an opportunity to speak to them or they create a, a situation, you know, an opportunity for her to talk, they will be more open to understanding that, you know, when they see, oh, he's just joking looks type mm. of thing. They're going, wait a minute you know, if we add that up to this and this and this, whatever that might be. So mm -hmm. at the very least, I hope that we have offered people some encouragement around there are options, there is hope. If you do feel off, or you have concerns for yourself or someone else, please reach out. I have in the show notes, links for emergency help for uh, other help, if it isn't even emergent at the moment. I'll also put links in for a friend of mine has, who actually has worked with Suggest. So she's created some checklists for emergency planning for, uh, you know, all those types of things. And uh, I share them on a guest blog that she has on the website, as well as in the resource page. So I will add links for that as well. People just need to tap and click. And your information, Trish, we will have available. So anybody who wants to talk to you more about that or to work with you, they can easily find you and and have those conversations thank you so much for being here and for the work you do and i look forward to having you back again great well thank you it's been great to, to talk about it and i look forward to the next time we, we chat thanks dina thank you i hope you found that conversation insightful encouraging and also a reminder to all of us that what we see isn't always as it appears. People are going through a lot of things in their lives and we would want that compassion shared to us and that is something that we can offer to others without judgment. Instead, be curious and, and reach out, reach in, figure out a way that you can make someone's day a little better and it might just start with a smile. I thank you very much for spending your time with me here today and I encourage you to please subscribe to the podcast Follow us on social media 
check out our events. We have lots of ways that we can help you or someone that you love. Share this with a friend. If there's someone that you know could benefit from this and hey, keep smiling that beautiful smile because the world really does need your sunshine. It means a lot that you spend this time with us and meet our experts and professionals who can help you through whatever life changes you're facing. Please refer to our terms of service available on our website, lifechangesmag.com. The link is in the show notes. Our disclaimer, Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine and Channel and Divorce Resource Groups are intended to educate and provide quality, credible resource information. The contents should not be used as factual until consultation with the appropriate professionals for any guidance. Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine, Life Changes Channel, as well as the Divorce Resource Groups do not constitute endorsements for, nor liability for any claims made in the presenting of this information.